rolling, check. Coming up on Off the Hardwood, we'll take you behind the scenes into the Toronto Raptors locker room. Who handles the uniforms, sneakers, laundry and travel arrangements? You'll find out. Also, one of the hottest teams in the NBA, the Raptors Dance Pack. Hello and welcome to another edition of Off the Hardwood. I'm your host, Paul Jones. And if the NBA is the show, then today we're gonna take you backstage. We'll learn about how to suit up a player on a 10-day contract. We'll learn about travel, accommodation, and you'll even get to meet the halftime entertainment. Joining me now, travel coordinator and equipment manager for the Toronto Raptors, Brian James. Brian, thank you very much for your time. Oh, anytime. Brian, you've been here since day one and is it true to say that you've seen more games than anybody else in this organization it's, live? It's definitely over 500 anyways, if you uh, figure 80 games a season, it's our seventh season. So I haven't kept exact track, but it's been a lot. How many games have you missed? I missed two, two for family reasons. And uh, other than that, I've been to every game since. How did you end up with the team? I mean, it was a, a proposition that started back in 95. How did you get this job? Well, it really was persistence. Um, I met Glenn Grunwald when he was the assistant general manager here um, through a friend and I, I hounded them for about a year. They hired a uh, trainer then who then interviewed me and uh, ran from it with it from there. Brian, a lot of your job involves travel, which is very important to an NBA team, being there and, and, and being here and, and being in the right place. What exactly does involve? Our goal is to get A to B as fast as we can um, with obviously a level of, level of comfort that I wish we all could enjoy every time we travel. Um, it's just a lot of coordinating. I run between our hotel bookings, our bus, bus bookings, and what the coach wants, what the team will require, and try and get it done as neatly and efficiently as possible. One of the big things we hear about an NBA team is the charter and the charter flight. What goes involved, what is involved in booking a charter and making sure that everything's set out for an entire trip? The, the charter itself is probably the easiest because you're letting, having them work on your schedule. Um, that's the luxury we have with dealing with a private chartered aircraft as they're sort of at your beck and call. Um, so that really is just sort of letting them know when we want to travel, um, why, and any logistics around that. They'll come back to us and tell us what will work, what won't work, and we, we both have to kind of tug it from either end and see what works best for both sides. The other part of your job is equipment manager and you're traveling with 12 guys who I think are responsible for maybe only their shoes. No, um, not even those. Not but, even uh, those. <laughs> what goes into the equipment travel? Um, we always joke because I think of, of pro sports we've got it the easiest. You know, people say 12 guys, shorts, tank tops and a basketball. Um, so that allows us to take care of the guys best we can. We try to eliminate as much as we can from their responsibility. We travel with their shoes, with um, all their gear that they'll need on a game day or practice day um, schedule. So a lot of it's just looking ahead, knowing the cities, knowing the facilities you're going to, knowing um, our counterparts in each city and how well they'll be able to uh, make your stay and your, uh, your time in the city easy or difficult. Now, the other part of it is uh shoot arounds, practices when you get to other places. How much, of, how much does that involve from you as well? Well again, you, you try to get everything laid out as far ahead. Try to work at least a month ahead um, and you just you contact each team as they contact myself and uh, you, requ you request a certain practice or shoot around time. And, and the, the league runs very smoothly that way. Um, as a general rule, teams shoot around at home at the same time. For example, we shoot around 11 a.m. to 12 noon every day here. So visiting teams know they can book either the hour before us or the hour after us. And that's a simple phone call. They'll call my counterpart or trainers from other teams will call me, ask when they can practice. Um, you're shooting from 10 a.m. to 11. You'll be on the floor before us, on the main floor. Uh, we'll shoot around afterwards, so uh, we'll chase you off the floor. But we'll be here to meet you and get you moved in and take care of everything you need. What has been, I know in seven seasons, there have been some glitches here and there. I know there were a few in the first couple of years. What would you look back and say has been the biggest glitch that 
you would say, oh no? <laughs> the one I still remember, we, we arrived in Washington, D.C. Uh, we flew into Dulles and landed, taxied into the FBO there, the, the private little terminal, and sure enough, there were no buses. So it's a mad frantic scramble <laughs> in five or ten minutes to find out where these buses are. Well, they were at BWI, the uh, wrong airport. So that was a matter of trying to see what we could do, how much time we had to wait for it to get there, and it resulted in us calling 25 to 30 airport uh, town cars and sending everybody in groups of two or three to the hotel. So you just sort of have to figure out what you can do, get it done as smoothly as possible, and, and hopefully the guys don't object too much to it. Brian, you talked about uh, you know, uh, doing things to make it smooth. Part of the job, too, falls on both you and, and one of your assistants, uh, Kevin DiPietro, in terms of loading the actual airplane. Oh, absolutely. Kevin, Kevin earns every penny when he's standing <laughs> out there in the rain, in the sleet, in the cold. Um, literally watching and helping bags get loaded and unloaded. He jumps up into the plane belly to help guys. Um, he rides with the equipment on our longer hauls. We'll have in a truck that just hauls all the equipment and personal bags. And you know, he makes a lot of friends with truck drivers and the guys, and they're usually regulars in each city. You, you develop quite a relationship with them, so he oversees all that as well. Well, we talked about the equipment. There's one thing I've always wanted to be, and that's a Raptor, even for 10 days. So if I become a Raptor for 10 days, Brian's going to fix me up. And when we come back, we'll show you what that's all about. Welcome back. Okay, Brian, I'm here. I'm in this great room, which any high school kid would love to get into and go yeah. wild. I'm a new player on a 10-day. Suit me up, man. What, what happens? Well, you're in the vault. We, we, we kind of joke about it. Um, this room actually is sort of built very specifically uh, for what we hold in here. You can't get in here except through the door. Um, <laughs> everything we've got in here is the most valuable to me, anyways. Um, not so much maybe the value, but the fact that it's tough to replace. Um, it's all the uniforms for all the players, both sets, everything we've got locked away in here. So when the team travels the night before a game, uh, if you've got a back-to-back -back or you've finished a home game, this would be the place where you would have to come and do your work. Yep, this is where myself or Kevin, who works with me, we come in and we'll pack our bags for the road. Um, in the meantime, we like to have everything hanging, you know, just keeps, the, keeps it looking best. But uh, either practice before or the day before, we'll come in here and pack up the, ba the road sets. You'll see them hanging in the back. Um, also where we keep all of the home gear. Uh, again, we hang dry as much as we can, and this allows it to hang nicely and, and safely. You have, this is, you know, the vault, and you have everything labeled. I'm looking up here, and it says, blood set and injured reserve. What does that mean? Um, the injury reserve is pretty straightforward. As you're aware, we've got our 12 active guys and then three guys generally that are um, on injury reserve. And so on a game night, we don't need to put their uniform out. So we separate it and leave it here so it's out of the way for us. The blood set's a little, uh, little more interesting. Um, you know, you've got uh, a new player gets injured, whether it's himself or another player on the floor, gets, if he gets the blood on the uniform, often the referees will stop the game and um, will require them to change, whether it's a jersey or their shorts. Um, and we have to be ready to go. The trainer will yell, password, if we're not out there, back to here to hurry up, get a jersey for whomever, and we'll come running back in. They're numerical from, from low to high, so it saves you some time searching. You need a jersey for Del Curry. You grab this one out. Some, usually they'll change right in the huddle out there. Um, guys will gather around, they'll throw a jersey on right there. We bring the bloody one back, wash it up, and he's got a fresh one to go. What happens when a new guy comes in? A uh, guy comes in on a 10-day or a trade, then what happens? It's a, it's a bit of a scramble. Um, you know, we're, they try to let us know as soon as they can without letting too many secrets out of the bag. Um, it's generally a bunch of phone calls. Uh, first call is to our cresters, um, a local cresting company here in Toronto. They've got an inventory, a supply of blank jerseys. We throw a name and a number at them and tell them to hurry up, get it down here as fast as they can. What happens when you're on the road? And we had talked about an interesting situation. The first year I was with the team, a trade happened. We were quite a ways from home and you guys really had to scramble. What happened there? Probably the most difficult <laughs> scenario. I remember that one with you. We were in Utah. Uh, we made a huge trade, four or five player trade. 
Um, I we got were, there and I, saw guys leaving the hotel, and exactly. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, exactly. So we sort of scrambled there where, again, call back to the Cresters. They've got jerseys on hand, give them the new, na new names and numbers of the players, and they, had, they crest them up within a couple hours if they can do it. In that case, they literally bought a plane ticket and sent these new jerseys out so they could be there the next day. And sure enough, we were ready to go for the next game. Uh, how much was that plane ticket worth? How much, how much was the trade worth from an auxiliary sense where wow, it was I, a plane ticket involved, do you know? Oh, not exact numbers, but I, it, it was push, pushing $1,000 just to get jerseys out there. Wow. I mean, wow. It, was, uh, it was all done in less than 24 hours uh, so the jersey could be there and ready for the next game. What about the shoes, Brian? One of the biggest things around is a shoe deal. And, you know, players, I see shoes in here. There are shoes, in, are, are the shoes kept in another room? We've got a whole another room, again, that uh, resembles sort of the back of a, a footlocker, a shoe store, where we do. We keep all kinds of shoes on hand. Every player's got his uh, sort of likes, dislikes. He wants to try something, um, along as well as the, the whole range of sizes. So uh, we keep that. There isn't room in here for the numbers of shoes we keep. Brian, who's responsible for coordinating some of that? The guys decide they're going to wear black shoes or white shoes. How much does that impact on what you and Kevin do? It's, it's a definitely a team vote. Start of the year, we've gotten on this trend the last few years where we're wearing black shoes on the road, white shoes at home. And it does create a lot more work, but it, the guys like the feel, they like the look of it. So it's just a matter of Kevin and I being sure that we've got enough of each supply on hand. Um, and it's just a team vote if they want to wear black at home or black throughout the playoffs, that kind of thing. It's whatever mental edge they can, they can use. Now, it also involves a lot of the little things, too, because sometimes I notice with the black shoes go the black socks. <laughs> and what... Does that pose a problem for you? Uh, not a problem, but again, it snowballs. Then you need black. You need a lot of options. You go from black socks to black sweatbands to purple sweatbands to white when you're at home. So it keeps us busy, definitely. But who's the guy that's probably the most high maintenance in terms of, you know, the shoes, the socks, the. the I mean, Jerome. I know Jerome Williams with those high socks. I know he needs some work. No, Jerome's pretty good because he's the only one, and we've had we have a lot of those around. As a matter of fact, um, the highest maintenance guy is gone. Was Oak with his shoes, very specific, but took care of you. You know, he's always great about it, polite, knew as long as you're doing your best. But uh, he was a lot of work just keeping him in shoes all year long. Now you talk about veteran players, and I know in the actual locker room there's a little bit of a pecking order there. Why don't we go in the locker room and uh, see what goes on in there? Sounds good. Here we are in a place where not many people get to visit or not many people get to see, but you spend a lot of time in here, Brian, and on a game day in the locker room, what is involved for you? Uh, well, on a typical game day, we'll practice for an hour in the morning. So we come in, Kevin and I set up, and the room itself is set, pretty tidy, as neat as we can make it. Guys come in, practice for the hour, and leave it sort of how it looks now, in a bit of a mess. So then before lunch, we have to tidy it up again and then go through and set uh, the game uniforms out into each locker. How many lockers, stalls, cubicles are actually in here? We've got 18 in total. Okay. Um, six, it's broken up into thirds, six in each third. So Now I'm looking over here, and this seems to be kind of power row, Antonio Davis. And I'm looking at Vince Carter's locker, and there's an empty one beside him. Michael Bradley's beside him. Don't tell me the rookie's got two lockers. No, no, certainly not. Vince, Vince usually needs a little bit more room just because of the media after the games. Um, sometimes the worst seat in the house could be next to Vince in a locker room because you'll get your toes stepped on afterwards with the, the, the rush of media. Um, Bradley might, might feel a little bit more room, but uh, Antonio specifically asked for Bradley to be put beside him, sort of take the rook under his arm keep a check on them, keep it in line. So that's why they're next to one another. Now, I noticed that there's a lot of laundry kind of lying around the place. Is that part of your duties and Kevin's duties as well? Absolutely. Kevin and I will sort of wander through, and, and we like the guys to keep their lockers as neat as they can on their own. We don't want to get into too much of their personal gear, but uh, we still make an effort to try and tidy things up as much as we can. I mean, make it look presentable. So, Kevin, how much do you actually do in terms of the volume of laundry? We do quite a bit. I mean, after every shoot around or after every practice, we're always doing laundry. It seems like I live here, so. On, the, on a game day, for example, with guys having a shoot around and then pregame, how many times would you actually be in here doing the laundry? Uh, probably anywhere from three or four times. A uh, day? A day, yeah. Um, whether or not it's, like I said, you know, we do shoot around in the morning, then we'll do a load, um, and then, um, after a game, uh, during the game, guys are working out beforehand. So then we start another uh, another load up right before the game, 
and then after the game we do about three or four loads of towels and uniforms. And so how much practice gear does a player own? A, a guy like AD or Vince, how many different sets of practice equipment does he have? Well, we have two sets for him at home, and we have uh, two on the road. Um, and like I said, we just keep an extra bin back here, so we're constantly uh, rotating it. Um, and that's the main thing. We always make sure that we always have a practice gear on their chair, so if they get here before us in the morning, um, you know, they always have gear, and that's the biggest thing as far as my job. Make sure they, these guys have what they need. What happens when you go on the road? I know that Brian has talked to us about a lot of the logistics on the road, but what happens in terms of the practice gear and getting it ready for the road? Yep, basically we have two sets. This is one of our sets right here. So we got in late last night, we wash it up, we'll put it back in. We have two sets so that, uh, you know, if, if one's dirty, if we do a shoot around in the morning, Usually we'll get the visiting team's uh, equipment guy to wash it up for us. Um, then that way we'll have an extra set that we can give them if we're going to go somewhere else and practice the next day. So, Is your biggest nightmare any one of these machines <laughs> breaking down? Well, I tell you, if, if they did, uh, we have some good friends over at the Leaf section there that they always say, you know, feel free to use their washing machine. So that's pretty important for us as well. But I don't know what would happen if these things ever broke down. Now, you and Brian have seen a lot of people come through, and when we look up at the wall, we see some of the great names from the past. Do you ever send these things away with the guys? You know, uh, we used to. Um, we were uh, we did a preseason game in Edmonton, and um, their guys gave us a tour of the Oilers locker room, and that's where we got this idea from. So I'd like to say that we could claim this, but we can't. And uh, so we we originally I think he did start giving away uh, name tags, giving them back to the players. But we've said uh, no, we're not going to do that anymore, and we're going to build our collection and. We actually have some back here. Some of the guys who need to go up here, some great names. Uh, you know what I mean? We miss, we miss some of these guys. Well, Brian, thank you very much. And I did see the shoe room. Uh, are any of those shoes uh, good for dancing? Uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay, well, when I, we come back, I'll be joined by the Raptors Dance Pack, and I'll have my dancing shoes on, and we'll see what we can do. Come on back. Time now for Off the Hardwood Raptors Trivia. Last week's question was, which team selected Raptors GM Glenn Grunwald in the 1981 NBA Draft? Answer, the Boston Celtics. The Celtics selected Grunwald in the fifth round, the 115th overall pick in the 1981 Draft. This week's question is, which Raptor played his collegiate basketball at the University of Texas El Paso? Send your answers to us at Off the Hardwood at TorontoRaptors.com. Off the Hardwood trivia winners will receive official Jerome Junkyard Dog Williams clothing. Welcome back, and now to the portion of the show that everybody's been waiting for, the activity portion where we join the dance pack. And joining me now, the choreographer. And Courtney, can you tell me about your background in terms of dance? Yes, I've been dancing my entire life. I started dancing when I was three. Um, my mom actually owns a dance studio, and she has been teaching me my entire life. And um, a couple of years ago, actually four years ago to be exact, I came out, auditioned for the Raptors Dance Pack. I made it on the team and two years later I was offered the position of coordinator, choreographer of the Raptors Dance Pack. How do you choose the team? There are a lot of very talented young ladies out there. How oh, do you yes. choose the team? Uh, we have auditions um, held here in the practice court uh, every summer and we have about 400 dancers who come out to audition that day and um, basically it's based on performance, um, how quickly they can pick up the routine, and um, just their training, their uh, technical skills, and um, 
what we do is we send the dancers in in groups of about 25. They're taught a short combination and uh, we select the dancers from there. Do you have to have a dance background? Is it necessary for you to have taken jazz or tap or something like that to be part of the team? Yes. Um, the dancers don't need any qualifications or certificates uh, to audition, but generally it is recommended that they have at least five years of dance training. All of the dancers on the team um, have been trained in jazz, ballet, hip-hop, tap, um, almost all forms of dance, and they've been training since they were quite young. How many girls or how many ladies are on the team or is there is it a case where there's a core and people get nights off? How does that work? Um, there's 17 female dancers on the team all together and we have four groups and there's 12 dancers in each group. Courtney, when you talk about the fans, the fans always have different tastes in things and music is something that not everybody has similar tastes. How do you choreograph your routines to satisfy all the different kinds of music and incorporate all the steps. Right. Well, I start with the music, uh, and the music selection is probably the most difficult part of the job. Um, high energy hip hop uh, is the style of dance that we do, and of course, I have to find music to match that. And it's a basketball game, so uh, popular slow R&B songs doesn't really suit a high energy basketball game. So um, I try to find high energy uh, hip hop music. How much is it? like an athletic event. I know there's warm-up, stretching and all of that involved. What about practices? Yes. Um, we start with a non-court rehearsal two and a half hours before game time and we stretch, we warm up, uh, we review the routines that we'll be performing that day but we also have three rehearsals per week for a total of nine hours. Uh, we do TKO classes, we do weight lifting and of course that's where I teach them uh, the actual routines. Okay well we're gonna test your teaching skills because I have not had no training in dance. <laughs> okay. You said it doesn't take any kind of training. Uh, nine hours of practice I don't have, but even somebody <laughs> like me, do you think you could teach me something? For sure. All right, the dancing shoes are on. I am going right. to destroy any myths about uh, rhythm and knowing how to learn moves and all of it. And, and uh, Courtney, we've got the group behind us. Yeah, everyone's here. Okay. To help you out? To help me out. And I'm, I'm going to need lots of help. Remember now, she said no training necessary, and I'm going to qualify that right now. I'm, <laughs> okay, I'm, you ready? I'm part of this now. I always kind of wanted to be part of a dance group. You know, you hear about the Laker girls. I think this is a better group here, so. All right. Put me in. Put me in. Okay, here we go. This is actually one of our fourth quarter routines. Okay. It's called number so this, two. this is when like the crowd is really into it? Yeah, during fourth quarter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, start with your right foot, cross it over, okay. and turn. Turn. Then we have walk, 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 slide to the right, slide, and together, and step out to the right. With the arms, we punch down. Oh no, One. it's getting complicated. Oh yes. Turn around. Can I use any of these moves when I go out dancing at the club? Sure. Okay. Sure. You better. <laughs> Five, six, six, seven, eight, go one, turn two, step three, step four, five together, six, seven, eight. Yes, good job. Thank you very much, ladies. I'm going to let you do it with the music. I'm going to step back, and this time I will applaud. Okay. That's it for another edition of Off the Hardwood, although I stand here out of breath on the hardwood. I'm Paul Jones, and we'll see you next week. Off the hardwood. Off the hardwood.